freaking first cut. Golly! Welcome to the First Cut Podcast. I'm Rick Gaiman, and this is your round three recap for this week's RBC Canadian Open. Joining me to break it all down, Greg Ducharme is here. Greg, hello, and good to see you. Good to see you too, Rick. Um, been, been quite a week, uh, but this this tournament is uh, turning out to be quite a good one. We've had some of the cream rise to the top, if you will. We got some Canadian players in the mix here, which would make somewhat of a history if one of them were able to do it. But it's been it's been a pretty cool week so far. For those keeping track at home, that was a quite a week. That was not an official what a week. <laughs> no, we'll save that for tomorrow. We'll save that for tomorrow. This moving day, Greg, before we dive into the names that will contend for this Canadian Open. Let's talk about the golf course for a second because we have not seen Oakdale in competition before, and we are going to get it again. I think it's 2026 it's due back to this uh, to co- the Canadian Open to come back to Oakdale. And I find a couple of things pretty interesting about it. One, obviously, it's been well-documented, the the two nines that are playing vastly different. The, the second nine, the back nine, playing two and a half shots easier than the front nine. That's pretty rare on the PGA Tour. But I, I like the range of scores that you can get out here. Um, the course only played a half shot under par. You know, we have seen plenty of golf courses play one or two strokes under par on the PGA Tour, only a half shot under par. Yet we saw rounds of 63, 64, a handful of 66s, which means you're going to see the opposite side of things, which we did. A couple of 77s, handful of 76s, some 75s out there. So it creates a really wide range of scores. And I don't think the scoring average really tells the entire story here. No, and it, you know, not an overly long golf course either, Rick. And so, what creates that? And it's not firm, and it's not really all that fast, right? It's kind of soft. So, what creates that difference? Well, you have really thick rough, and you have a lot of trees. And, and when you when you add that combination, it puts a lot of pressure on your tee shot. And if you have a round like Carl Yuan did today, where you only hit five fairways, you're you're fighting behind the eight ball all day. I mean, we've seen guys, um, you know, advance the ball a couple of yards out of the rough, right? We've seen some of those top shots. It comes out tumbling. You get some really challenging lies and situations in this really thick rough. Uh, and, and if you hit it into the trees, you got another set of circumstances. Now you got to keep it low. You got to carry it over rough. You got to keep it shy. The fair, it, it creates a lot more challenges. So, I, I like that aspect. Uh, I like having that really difficult stretch, three, four, five, and six, and then a back nine where I mean, you're basically trying to hang on on the front nine. If you can get in th- through there under par, you're in really good shape, and then you go chase it on the back. Um, there's probably you know one hole I'm not a big fan of. 18 is it, it's very it's close to being a really good hole, but well, it's. What would make it? What would make it a good hole? Well, it, it's like too far. It, it's not worth it to try to hit it over the creek. Mm. You know, if it were a little longer and guys were hitting driver or three wood uh, to the that narrow area, mm-hmm. like if if the question is, well, can you hit driver into a twenty six yard area with a little bit of slope, or you hit three wood shy of the hill? I mean, this is a four. This is four iron three wood. It's it's a a bizarre thing. So you almost end up with everybody hitting it to the same place off the tee, and then it's a fairway wood into the green. And and if it was a little, if the tee was back a little farther or a little farther forward, where guys were challenged to go over the creek, um, well, now I, I think it makes the hole a little bit more interesting. So it, it's close, but it's a little it's a little odd. We got a couple of years to figure it out. We'll see what they can do at 18. Well, usually we start with kind of an early mover or maybe a guy that is going to play a role in the storyline on Sunday. Nick Taylor checks off both of those boxes for us because he got out early and shot not only the round of the day, the round of the tournament, and technically, because this is the first time at Oakdale, the the course record with this composite of 27 that we are playing here this week, marked down to 18, a 63, Greg, a bogey-free 
63. Out in 31, that's the difficult side. In in 32, and he, he injects himself into the conversation of trying to become the first Canadian to win the Canadian Open since either 1954 or 1899, whoever you believe. 11 under par for the tournament. He will enter the final round three shots off the lead. And, um, you know, the golf course really suits him well. But when I look at this scorecard, the biggest thing to me is the, is playing that stretch three through six in two under par. I mean, that that's a huge advantage. Not only does he not make a bogey, but he gets, he, he gets away with two birdies in that stretch, which is really nice. Um, so this, look, when you go shoot a 63 and set a course record, it's a great round and it requires a lot of things to go really well. And uh, just like you said, Rick, an early mover and somebody who may be a part of the conversation checks all the boxes. Well, he checked all the boxes of what it takes to put together a great round. Another aspect I really like of this golf course this is what it takes. I mean, he hit, hits 10 fairways, hits 14 greens. Uh, he, he, he hit a lot of iron shots really close and he made a lot of putts from outside of 20 feet. Right. So he, he did it all today, um, which is, which is really cool. Sometimes you see guys shoot 63 and they just fill it up on, they make everything they look at um, or, or they're just stuffing it close all day. But you know, this was a really well-rounded, really complete game that Nick Taylor showed today. And you know, it, it didn't feel too magical in a way. It felt like there were a couple of bonuses for sure, but it just felt really solid. And I think that's a really good sign for him heading into tomorrow. This stretch that you refer to, uh, three, four, five, six, he played it at two under. It played a hair over one stroke over par. So that's gaining three shots of the field on four holes. It was also, Greg, how about this? The single best round of Nick Taylor's career. He gained 8.48 strokes to the field today. His previous best was an event he won, the 2020 Pebble Beach Pro-Am. Round one, he gained 8.35. So uh, good time on home soil to get your single best round. Now you got a little bit more work to do. Uh, and I think he would bring the house down if he was able to, to finish this thing off tomorrow. Oh, absolutely. He absolutely would. But I wanted to ask you, you mentioned the round at Pebble beach. Um, that has a little bit of an asterisk next to it. Cause you're only going up against what, a third of the field in that round. How, yeah. how does that, does that make it more impressive or um, or less, you know, that's a good question. You're right. Cause that has to be, ca it's calculated based on what course he was at for the day and all that stuff. But you're right. It's only going to be a third of the field. I don't know. Is that more impressive? I, I would say it's less impressive. Uh, yeah, that'd be my lean too. So you got an asterisk next to that one. It just, look, he won that tournament. So there's nothing, it's not like I've taken anything away from, uh, from that round. It's just a little caveat and, and it speaks to how, just how good this round was today. Yeah, another really good round was out of Tommy Fleetwood. Uh, eight under mm. 64, uh, which is one shot worse, obviously, than Nick Taylor's nine under 63. This was with a bogey on the card. Did not survive that stretch three, four, five, six unblemished. He made bogey on six, but played that stretch at even par. That stretch needs a name, Greg. If we have the horrible horseshoe, if we've got a man corner, if we've got the undertow, if we've got uh, the green mile, if we've got et cetera, et cetera, this four hole stretch, which is incredibly difficult, needs a name. And all, they're all par fours. Maybe it's um, the feared four or oh, something. Feared four. Because they're all par fours. Most of those stretches have a par three in there. Um, the bear you know, trap. The bear that's trap. Two, that's two, two par, par threes. threes. Yeah. Right. So, it, you know, it creates a, a very name worthy situation because they they play like every day the four hardest holes on the golf course. Yeah, by far. That, that <laughs> never happens. You yeah. know, like even at the green yeah. mile, yeah. 17 one day will be up. It'll give up a bunch of birdies. Um, it's like whole location dependent T box setup dependent. This is just, nope, they're, they're the hardest holes every day. Yeah. Which is unique. Um, but yeah. Tommy, yeah. After Tommy's got to go after a pair of seventies, uh, Greg, Tommy shoots this 64. Yeah. He, um, I, I think he's starting to trend in the right direction uh, even before this event. You know, he was one of those guys. Um, that I was, I, I really, there were three guys I liked all European 
Rose, Fleetwood, and Lowry, who I thought were all kind of trending in this um, positive direction. It seems it seemed all year like Fleetwood hasn't been as impressive as you know maybe Justin Rose has as far as w- what's happened recently, but um, but it seemed like his ball striking, his tee to green play is looking more and more like it did in 2018. And, and, and you saw that today. He drove it beautifully today. Hit 12 of 15 fairways. Now led the field in strokes gain off the tee mm-hmm. and gave himself a number of opportunities in that 10 to 15 foot range. And and he, he cashed in on them. So he led the field today in strokes gain putting as well. Uh, but when you watch that round, it was like there were so many good looks that he had. It wasn't. It, it didn't feel like he was just hooping it from everywhere. It's like he he made putts that you think you should make. Um, and maybe you'd like to make, but it, it wasn't these crazy 25, 30 foot putts going in all over the place. It was, oh, I hit it to 10 feet and made it. I hit it to 13 feet and made it. I hit it to 14 feet and made it. Um, it so it, it was it was really good and took advantage of the par fives, which is also um, really helpful. Yeah, Tommy Ladd still looking for that first win on the PGA Tour. He's going to give himself a good chance being two shots back with 18 to go. We still have to talk about Rory McIlroy. We still have to talk about Justin Rose. We still got to talk about the guy who's leading the golf tournament, which is neither one of those two. But first, we're going to take a quick break and hear a word from our partners. Someone hunted a hunter. This is the work of serial killer. Pick of things they can do a cop's job. Drop your weapon! Stand down! No one trusts a lone man in a while. Joe Pickett Season 2 is now streaming on Paramount+. Plus. Use promo code PICKET for one month free trial. Credit card required. Terms apply. And we're back. We started Block 1 with Canadian Nick Taylor. Let's start Block 2 with Canadian Corey Connors. And it wasn't bad he beat the field by a stroke and a half it was two under 70 three birdies and one bogey but Corey Connors was a bit carrying the weight of uh, the Canadian fan base on Saturday a little bit of a disappointing 70 that will have him four shots off the lead heading into the final round yeah and only two shots off a second Uh oh the real lead the real the real lead this is a real lead situation no disrespect to the, the bread man. CT, you're telling me CT Pan being two shots clear of Tommy Fleetwood, Rory McElroy, and Justin Rose is not the real lead. It defines the real lead. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is this is the absolute example one A of what the real lead is. Yes. The, the, so look, the real lead's at twelve, <laughs> and and CT Pan could do it. Uh, we'll get to him in a little bit, but. Um, so yeah, co- the point is, and the only point I'm making is that Corey Connors is right in the mix of this tournament uh, and Corey Connors is playing this week. Corey Connors golf mm. uh, today. He had to lean on the short game a little bit more and, and it was good. He, he got, he didn't hit quite as many greens today. Um, but you know, I, I like to, after I watch these tournaments, I go and refresh and study the scorecards and, study the you know shot trackers and all that and Corey connor's scorecards look the same every tournament no matter what yeah it doesn't matter if it's the pga or the you know a a major or uh you know a birdie fest there's like three birdies four birdies a bogey or no bogeys it's it, it is so impressive how steady and consistent he is and when you actually watch him hit golf shots, you understand why he just, he plays the same shot over and over and over again. It's a little draw. If it misses it, it just doesn't draw. It's rarely does he miss left. It's just so steady. Um, and, and that's what he did again today. I mean, he hit a lot of fairways today, he missed a couple more greens than usual, but he doesn't put himself in really difficult situations. Um, I guess he did today on 18, but that's a, a, a long shot into that green. Uh, so look, this is Corey Connors being Corey Connors. Tomorrow, he's going to need a little bit more magic. He's, some One of these guys, 
uh, is going to, is going to fill it up again on the greens and go make a ton of birdies. And, and for Corey Connors to do that, he doesn't have to do anything different to the green. It, it's just, it has to be a hot putter. And the putter has not been cold per se this week, but it, it's just, he's got to gain three shots tomorrow on the greens and, and then I, and then he can do it. Um, but that hasn't happened all week. He's gaining just over a half a shot for the week. Um, and, and he, he, it's, it's not atrocious, right? He is not a team. No putt guy. It's just very, he's like a zero. He's like a zero putter. Then he needs to, he needs a spike, a spike day tomorrow. A spike day with the flat stick came on Saturday from Justin Rose, who gained over three and a half strokes putting second in the field. He made eight birdies, eight pars, two bogeys in route to a, a six under 66, which was highlighted by this second nine, Greg, where he made five birdies in a row, 12 through 16, took a little bit of a break on 17 with a par, and then got one more on 18 to come in in 30. And you talked about it a little bit earlier. Uh, a resurgent year for Justin Rose continues. It does. Um, and again, it's very similar, although more m- more pronounced than Tommy Fleetwood. This is starting to look like the guy uh, that was world number one in 2018. Now, he, he is not as long as he was then, uh, at least relative to the field. So he's a, a much shorter hitter than he used to be. Um, but he is swinging beautifully and the iron play is really coming along, you know, over his last three weeks entering, uh, this tournament, he had improved his strokes gain approach. Um, and, and he gained like what, what, almost eight shots approaching the green, uh, at the Charles Schwab. So yeah. things are really starting to look precise with the iron play. And he did that on the back nine. He gave himself a ton of opportunity. I mean, it really, he should have finished this round with seven birdies in a row. He had 10 feet for a birdie on 17, and it was very makeable. Yeah, and it, and it didn't go. I mean, look, you're not going to hold it against the guy, but it was a heck of a round. But it, I mean, he's 10 feet away from this being seven birdies in a row to finish. And, and he has that capability, it seems like, every round because there's so many short holes on this back nine. Uh, the way that he's striking those short short irons and wedges, it's a it's really pretty to watch. So you know he's a he's a guy I have circled on on my list heading into tomorrow for sure. I will give him a little bit of a hat tip because he did the uh, he came in you know sat with Amanda and did like the call the play by play call afterwards. And there's there's kind of two types of guys that you get here. What the the one guy who does not speak unless someone says hey. Justin Rose, what do you think of that shot that just happened? Or the guy who just jumps in and starts talking about the shot and relates it to the shot that he had from a similar position or a putt that he had or the difficulty of the shot. Justin Rose was the latter. I loved it. I was I was impressed by it. I like when they just get in there, start calling the shots and have after it. That that's what I'm here for, right? Yeah. I mean, you're, you're here to talk. It, it's not like if you or I, Rick, were put in that position, it'd be like, okay, the last thing I want to do is talk too much, right? I don't want to. But if it's Justin, nobody's going to be annoyed by getting Justin Rose's analysis. He just played the golf course, just shot 66. He's right there in the mix. We want to hear from you, Justin. Uh, and and he gave us that, yeah. and he always does. I mean, his his interviews are are world-class. He, he gives you so much detail. It's well thought out. Uh, it, it's an honest reflection on his game. You know, he talked about the patience of getting through the front nine and, and how that's kind of the way this golf course works. And then he, he felt like he started to get rewarded on the back nine. And very clearly he did. The pre-tournament favorite, the guy who we spent all the oxygen on, the guy who I at least said, oh, man, with that wedge game and that putter and everything that he's dealing with, no way he's in the mix come Sunday. That guy, Rory McElroy, a six under 66 bogey free. He did all of his work, Greg, by the time he was done on 13. He actually played the last five holes at even par. Probably felt like a couple of opportunities got away from him there. But if we are calling it the real lead, 12 under par, which is two shots off the actual tournament lead, uh, then Rory McElroy is there. and. I'll tell you what I I'm I I will never I will never speak ill of Rory again leading into a golf tournament. 
Well, I can understand where you're coming from. I mean, with this week that we've had, it's a bit of a shock for someone like Rory McIlroy. Now, um, on Thursday, I did say that this was going to be a good thing for Rory. I, I believe that this, all of this news in the world of golf is going to simplify things for Rory. Uh, and he no longer has to be a, you know, sounding board. He's, he's not fighting a war anymore, right. whether, whether you like it or not, it's irrelevant. Things have gotten simplified unless he's lobbying with the, you know, department of justice or something, which <laughs> no, I think, Rory, I think Rory's done going to battle for a, a cause. <laughs> right. Right. So it, it feels like this war is over and now Rory can focus on his game, but that's not really what this week is about for me. You know, that's that's coming kind of I was thinking U.S. Open rest of the year. Maybe that's come a little sooner because things look really good. It just it, he's the guy where it, it feels like he's just this good. You know, it, it's like he's putting really well, yeah, yeah. Um, but he still hit a couple of putts that, that aren't I'm not crazy about. Um, but I love what he's doing on the greens overall. The wedge play is it. it, it uh, what do you think about the wedge play, Rick? Because I'm, I'm very much in the middle of, on that. Um, I thought he hit a couple good ones. I thought he hit a couple good ones on on um, on Saturday. I think that overall, listen, Rory McIlroy is a world class player and has been a world class player for ten years. Uh, it is very nitpicky, but I think it is pretty safe to say that wedge that wedge game can be one of the weakest parts of his game. Now, there are probably 90 guys on tour that would trade wedge games with him, right? Like, it, it, we're putting it all into perspective here. Um, so I think because of how high the bar is for Rory and the expectations, and every time he gets in contention, if he doesn't win, you have to point at something. Last week, it was easy to point at the misses with the wedge. I don't think he's great with a wedge in hand, but he doesn't always have to be. Right. Absolutely right. And, uh, and he also gives himself so many wedges, yeah. you know, that's another, that's another aspect to it, but there's still some misses in the distance control where agreed, you know, that's where I think he could really improve. He comes up 25 feet short from a hundred yards. How bad is that statistically? No, it, no, it, it's not terrible. Um, but it, but you're talking about somebody who we view as a, top player in the world you know maybe the maybe the best player in the world at least talent wise um so th it, it definitely lacks when you look at scotty scheffler he's flag high all day mm -hmm. uh and rory's not so but i do feel like for this week we look at just this tournament the wedge play is getting better i thought yesterday's wedge play was better than round ones and i thought it was kind of the same today so some good ones, some shaky ones, but all in all, he shoots 66 and it was really fun to watch when he's making putts. It mm -hmm. it's fun to watch. Yeah, it is. Well, we've talked about Nick Taylor. We've talked about Corey Connors. We've talked about Tommy Fleetwood and Justin Rose and Rory McIlroy and the man at the top of the leaderboard who they are all chasing down with a multiple shot lead heading into the final round of Canada's national championship is, of course, C.T. Pan, who fired an opening round 70 and has backed it up with a pair of 66s. Statistically, Greg, this week he is seventh from tee to green and third in putting. Very good combination. That gets you to the top of the leaderboard. And it's been a little bit bizarre or not not even bizarre just like under the radar for yes Stant, who hasn't even played in a month since the byron nelson he finished fourth there and missed his four cuts prior leading into that event all of a sudden he's leading the canadian open with 18 to go i thought he had a really interesting interview with amanda renner afterwards uh talking about the wrist injury which i, I think Explain if I understand the timeline correctly, that explains the poor play heading in. Um, so I I certainly understand that. Uh, but it 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 is under the radar, especially coming into the week. But even today's round felt very under the radar. 
you know, he's getting up and down here, getting up and down there, making a birdie on a par five here. Uh, he birdied all, all three par fives today, which is great, but it, it wasn't anything shocking. Right. Maybe that's because he made birdies at one and two and then, yes. you know, a bunch of pars and he kind of, you got Rory up there. You got Rosie up. You got a bunch of guys making big moves and he's just kind of cruising along. And next thing you know, he birdies 17 and 18 and it's 66 and he's leading by two. Um, it really, really impressive stuff. It, um, well-rounded, I would say it's kind of like, um, who was I talking kind of like Nick Taylor, but you know, he didn't make the long putts that Nick Taylor made. Um, good short game. He, he missed a bunch of green. He had 13 greens today. Uh, or he had 10 greens today. Excuse me. Um, a b- bunch of really nice up and downs. So it, it is under the radar. It's difficult to describe this round other than really good. Um, and I have no idea what to expect tomorrow. Well, CT Pan has one PGA Tour victory. Do you remember? Do you remember it? Of course, the RBC <gasps> Heritage. Oh, is he? A, is he go? Is he like an RBC guy? Is he going for the RBC Slam? Well, this would be the RBC Slam. Yeah, uh, I don't believe he's an RBC guy yet. Well, if he it, wins this, he might, he might as well be. Yeah, I mean, he's got to be, got to be on your list. Do you remember what year that was? I always get the years confused because especially especially the 2020 year threw me out of whack. I don't know if that was five years ago, a hundred years ago, or last. Yeah, year. I think it was before that. Was it? Was- it- was it 19? It was 19. Yeah. The 2019 RBC Heritage, he beat Matt Kuchar by a shot. Yeah, really, really good player. I mean, he, what, he won the bronze medal at the Olympics? He won, we got to give him his credit, a seven-way playoff Yes, for the bronze medal at the Olympics. Yeah, he's a, he's an impressive player. And when, when he's playing well, you know, he's kind of a tee to green specialist, right? Um, and he's got the flat stick rolling now. He said to make some changes to the routine, a lot more focus on recovery. I'm very curious how that's going to work out because I, that can be a, you know, he's still working hard, but he's not putting so much attention into hitting ball after ball after ball. Kind of got to be careful. Got to be, like he said, I got to be a little more focused on each shot when I'm practicing uh, because I have fewer to hit. Sometimes that can, you know, a change in the routine can provide a spark. So I, I'm fascinated to see what he does tomorrow. He's got to put the ball in the fairway, especially with his wrist. Um, that's what his doctors told. Just don't hit it in the rough. Oh, that's right? you'll be fine. <laughs> no but but particularly uh, on Sunday in the final group of the Canadian Open with Rory and Rosie uh, and Fleetwood and a number of other players breathing down your neck. He's got to put the ball in the fairway. All right, let's play this game. Um, who did CT Pan beat? Who were the six other guys in that playoff? Uh, I have not committed this to memory okay. the way that I should. Uh, Colin Morikawa. Colin Morikawa, that's one, yeah. It, was came, it-, it came down to those two. It, it was a four, it ended up being a four hole playoff. Right. It, it came down to those two, yeah. Um, Let's see. Rory Sabatini was the silver medalist. That is correct. Okay. And Xander was obviously the gold. Was there another American in the playoff? There was not. Okay. I didn't think so. Was Hideki Matsuyama in the playoff? That is correct. Hideki and Colin were both in there. Yep. We had a we had a European in there too. We did. Um and probably we, one that is not super top of mind. No. We played the <laughs> we played this game before. I think that's the hard one. I think I think the Europeans the hard one. Uh, we have a South African. No, you know what we do have though. We've got a we've got one, two, three of them are now on live. Does that help? Oh, is Mark Leishman one of them? No, no. No, nah, you got to help me out. This is going to take too long. So we got Colin Morikawa. We got Hideki Matsuyama. The the tough European is Paul Casey because he just, I mean, like just ha- he like didn't even play for a long time and then right. went to live. Uh, the other two livers were 
Sebastian Munoz, Mito Pereira. Oh, okay. And I was ready to give you, I was ready to give you one because you said, did Rory and then Sabatini. And I was like, Oh, it was Rory McIlroy. McIlroy was in that. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So we'll, either, either Rory gets his revenge on Sunday or CT pan becomes like a Rory <laughs> killer. <laughs> right. I, I mean, I, I guess <laughs> I don't see it any other way. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So there, you got this as a two horse race. Does Vegas agree? No, I don't think so. So Josh, do we have the betting odds? I'm certain they do not agree with that take whatsoever. Yeah. Rory McElroy is uh, your favorite plus 270. CT Pan, your leader at four to one, Justin Rose and Tommy Fleetwood at five and five and a half to one. So basically a four horse race because then everybody else is uh, double digits. Mark Hubbard's 11 to one, Andrew Novak 16, Nick Taylor uh, 16 to one. So I would say Vegas has this at like a four horse race and then it would take a real a real dark horse to uh yeah to get in there yeah this is um you could say that it's not a two horse race but i could see where they're coming from here you got rory it, this is either going to be the rory slayer or rory's revenge uh so we'll see how that plays out but the guy that i really like and i don't love the number now but i liked him so much before the tournament is Justin Rose. Mm -hmm. um, and he's right there in the mix. So I'm not going to back off of that. Uh, he would be my favorite to win heading into tomorrow. I love the position. If we're looking a little farther down the board, you know, I wish Nick Taylor didn't shoot 63 today to be in this position because I love his profile. And I really like the round today. It just, it's so rare that you see somebody move that far up the board on Saturday and then continue up the board on Sunday. So I have a hard time with him. So the guy beneath Justin Rose that I really like the most is actually Aaron Rye. Um, I, I love what he's doing with his profile. It's been simple. It's been steady. He wasn't really on the coverage very much today. Um, there wasn't a whole lot going on, but it was a really nice round of golf. Uh, and, and I like what he's doing. He's leading the field to the green. Um, playing really solid. And I think he's just a nice player. The question is, can he actually win the tournament? Mm. Um, and that's the, that's so he's my favorite profile, but yeah, I think Rory probably wins it, but I don't think you can bet it. I, I don't mind. I mean, the Rose at five or the Fleetwood at five and a half is, is probably where I'd go right now. How about I read you? Yeah. The, um, how about I read you the pairings here? So yeah, final pairing CT pan, Tommy lad, Tommy Fleetwood. Yeah, uh, the, the penultimate group, Rory McIlroy, Mark Hubbard, the third to last group, Justin Rose, Harry Higgs. Uh, McIlroy and Hubbard played today. That's right. So comfy, yeah. comfy back at it again. Yeah. Hubbard played some really good golf. Yeah, too. Hubbard's Hubbard's good golf got overshadowed by Rory's like, right, board. right. It, it's again, it's hard to see Hubbard winning this thing. But, I mean, his iron play and wedge play was phenomenal today and has been all week. So I, I like that. But, boy, Rick, does that la does that final pairing worry you? Could you see them being kind of like Carl Yuan and Aaron Rye today? I think there is a chance that, that they get dropped from coverage quite early. I mean, you know, Tommy, Tommy listen, I, I want Tommy to break through. Um it's going to be tough with Rory in tow with Justin Rose in tow. It's just hard to win in general on the PGA tour. Right. I mean, if you, if, if, if odds makers have him at five and a half to one, it implies what he's going to win it like 12% of the time, something like that. It's yeah. Not, it's not a huge number. So there, there's not a lot going in his favor. Um, and we've seen this sometimes where, and, and listen, CT man might go out and shoot another 66 and win this thing. I don't know, but right. If one of your guys starts going sideways out of the final group, there's a little bit of gravity to it. And I, I, yeah. I worry about that a little bit. Yeah, it, it just seems like it could get really shaky. Yeah. You no, know, CT Pan could win if he shoots 69 tomorrow. Probably. You know, I, I think that's probably the no. If he breaks 70 tomorrow, he probably at least gets into a playoff. Uh, that would be that would be my guess anyway. That would put him at 17. Um, you're looking at a five under. Eh, he might need more. He might need 68. Yeah, and while we we'll put a bow on it with this hat tip. So that that Rory Hubbard group shot twelve under, which early in the morning I don't uh, we didn't mention it. Nick Taylor was playing with 
uh, Grace and Sig, and they were like the two best rounds on the golf course. They also shot 12 under together. So there were some good vibes out there. Yeah. In a couple of, couple of different groups. We'll see if they can uh, get it going again on Sunday. Okay. This time tomorrow, Greg, we will have a new Canadian Open champion, and we will officially turn the page to Los Angeles Country Club for the United States Open Championship, which will be very exciting stuff. Big thanks to producer Josh, who does all the hard work behind the scenes. Greg Ducharme available on Twitter at the real GFD, and you can find me at Rick Run Good. This has been the first cut. We'll catch you next time.